I'm resident of Colorado, Joel Sains for YouTube. I'm joined by my buddy Gordon Dabowski, my buddy Patrick McCray. We're here to talk about Dark Shadows, episode 479. Barnabas makes a very, very big decision. At least that's what I would title this episode. Uh, there's only four cast members in this episode, oh, yeah. guys. Roger Davis, Addison Powell, Jonathan Fred, and Alexander Mulkey. Uh, well, she, she does the opening narration. This is The episode is also written by Ron Sprout and directed by Leva Swift. So, Patrick, you picked this episode. It's a, it's actually a pretty big episode in from a character standpoint, at least from Barnabas's standpoint. What do you think, man? Oh yeah, well, it's uh, it's great. It's one you know Barnabas has several moral um, moral turns in in the series, and they all happen in fairly quick succession. And and this one is uh, probably the the I think the first and the most profound. And you know, Barnabas says twice in the episode, you know, this is where I finally say enough, and this is where we have really exhibit A of Barnabas being a, a decent person in his modern incarnation. The guy he was in 1795 isn't dead, um, and. And I and I love that, you know, it would be followed up by, you know, when he uh, smashes the equipment when they're bringing Eve back. And and so this kind of initiates his his kind of finding himself sort of rediscovering who he is and who he wants to be. Uh, and for that, it's it's very moving. And, you know, for an episode that deals with just arguments of ethics uh it is pretty extraordinary um in that it moves quickly it doesn't feel too talky but Halfred has one of the scenes basically alone you know and uh, and and you know carries it very well um uh, and you get good action stuff with Roger Davis who uh, has a couple of great quips? One where he says, "Yeah, I'll I'll return the scalpel right in your ribs," and and there's another one where he's he's got he's got Lang at scalpel point, and Barnabas says, "Hey, I just want to point out something." He says, "Yeah, I'll be with you in a minute," <laughs> and and returns the scalpel back. It's, it's some some really fun Roger Davis stuff. Uh, very underrated actor, I think. Um, yeah. uh, and uh, uh, and just a. a a fine episode. It's very Cyrano-esque. You know, Cyrano de Bergerac uh, is all about a guy who is so in love with a woman that he will he will be a party to her relationship with another man just because he he wants to see her happy. You know, he would rather he would rather see that happen than him sort of get what he wants, but her forever to be in mourning. And so, yeah, they're, they're great, great literary kind of um, reverberations with, with this one. I, I love it. Gordon, what did you think? Um, well, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, I think the first is that I think that Edison Powell and Keith Prentice went to the same voice coach. Um, yes, they did. Um, yeah, I think it was, it's one of those, uh, it's one of those, it's not a bad episode. For me, it was kind of one of those where it's kind of a, it's kind of a loop in that, you know, you, you start with, with Roger Davis being threatened and it ends with Roger Davis seemingly close to that, close to death, but it does a lot in that loop in terms of revealing Barnabas's character in terms of revealing a lot about who Eric Lang is. And I think it also does, it, it kind of starts to push Victoria a little bit more as a character that she's no longer, she's kind of gone past being the ingenue, the, the, the new girl who is discovering her past and she's more like, okay, I'm someone who, she actually has a life. Um, I do like the fact that that um, when when Barnabas is threatening to tell Julia, Lane's like, no, 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 oh, she won't believe you. 
you know, because because as as we all know, Dr. Eric Lane is a paragon of sanity. So, yeah, I thought it was a pretty good episode. Well, he's also um, he's a he's a paragon of evil. You know, we can't let the girl in on this, uh, which is essentially you know what he's saying. Um, uh, yeah, Lang and Lang and Barnabas have have some have some great material with that, and as you're saying, Julia is the most important character in the episode who's not in the episode mm -hmm. is of and and i it's it's interesting because you know barnabas kind of starts this arc along the lines of so there julia my friend eric cured me what were you able to do to turn me into an old man uh and and through this yeah even though eric has delivered some of the goods he's he now has a much greater appreciation for Julia as a moral center and as a friend. You know, Julia makes more progress in 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 Barnabas's life as his friend in this episode where she doesn't even appear than in everything leading up to it. Oh, it's great. I think Barnabas's character decision here is very very important. The the writers, the writers pick this episode to have Barnabas make a really important decision, and I think from a, with everything else going on, it's not it's not just Jeff Clark. Let's let's be clear too. It's they also know. Look, Barnabas knows he's on borrowed time. One, Lane's treatments for him are working less and less. That's actually brought up in this episode because. He felt the urge to go seek out somebody, but he didn't though. So he, there's that. the 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 treatment's working less and less. They need to they need to get Lane's experiment up and running. And Barnabas Barnabas said, "Well, can you make it Jeff Clark's face?" Well, he's that's it. That's exactly what Doctor Eric Lane's trying to do is cut Jeff Clark's face off. I literally think this episode. Is somewhat the inspiration for the movie Face Off. Um, I could be wrong. Also, you have Cassandra slash Angelie. She's she's ever so present, and th that's another thing too. He knows that he's on borrowed time with the whole Angelique thing. He knows how he's been trying to tell not only Doctor you know Doctor Eric Lane, uh, you know, witch. There's witch, and. Lane, he's a he's a mad scientist. He he believes in science. This isn't a man who hasn't have doesn't have time for witchcraft and nonsense. But he has an anti witch. Well, he has he, an anti witch medallion, Jewel. Well, the only reason he has the the, the only reason Lane has the medallion, it, it really agrees to accept the medallion is to really more humor Barnabas than anything else. I think this is remember, which. <sighs> When you're when he brings up a witch to Eric Lane, looks like a witch. It, again, this is a man of science. He this isn't somebody who who will. Okay, you could say well he believes in a vampire. He believes in the the supernatural. He more he more believes in the undead than anything else. And again, this isn't somebody who Barnabas was somebody who wasn't born a vampire. So. He physically he dies, but he doesn't. But he's not fully dead in a sense. His cells need need cured, but Lane can treat him, but he can't fully cure him. So he, he creates Adam to put Barnabas's eventually put Barnabas's life force in Adam, which we all thought that the the way they originally wrote this is that Barnabas was going to, you know be in Adam and his entire life force was going to be in Adam but only half of his life force the vampire half is in Adam and that's how Jonathan Fritz's character is going to become human so with this but with this episode specifically you have you know Dr. Eric Lane who's trying to you know take Jeff Lane's face off uh or sorry uh yeah Jeff Clark's uh face off uh with yeah. the scalp uh, that's the scalp science with, which I which I love, um, very very sort of slasher esque episode in a way when you're messing around with the knife. I love 
Roger Davis's line. I'll, I'll put this scalpel right into your ribs. Great line for for a protagonist. And they Jeff Jeff Clark is given is knocked out in this episode like so many times. It's not even funny. But it's believable, and I like that too. And the decision by Barnabas to say, you know what, enough's enough is all the more. Because he realizes by talking to Victoria that she's never going to choose Barnabas over Jeff Clark, ever. And I think that that also realization brings Barnabas to his decision of, if I really do this, if I do this here, I am no better than the woman who put this curse on me. And I think that helps too with the moral. I mean, there's a lot of other things that go into it, but I think that there is, is thought about with Barnabas. But what do you guys think? I'm rambling on. Sorry. I, I think that is critical because I think with Barnabas, since he came out of the coffin in 1966, has a bit of a creeper problem. Because he basically, oh, that, that waitress looks like my fiance. So I'll throw her in, in my face, I'll throw her in, in a coffin and and taunt her and try to convince her that she's you know she that that, that she belongs to me. With Victoria, it's a little he's bit he's a good man. Uh, yes. With Victoria, he's a little bit more of the yeah, I, I have feelings for her, but I mean, he, she's rebound girl, for, for lack of a better word. Yeah. I think at some point... Oh. Pardon? I just agreed, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I think when you look at, at Barnabas's evil, you know, kind of how he tends to relate to... I, I, his, his relationships with women don't necessarily improve with time. Um, you can see that warming... Ironically, with Angelique, because when he's interacting with her in 1897, there's a little bit more, it's a little bit more developed. Um, but I think at this point, Barnabas is like, I think he was written to be like like a late 20s, or like like someone in their 20s or 30s, where having that that you know infatuation would have been expected. But with with Fred playing it. You get the sense that he's like, like there's a piece that he's learning right now that he's coming to a realization that he should have come to a while ago. Yeah. I think, yeah. I, I think well, he, and that. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, you there? Okay, um, that brings us to. Uh, yeah, I was waiting for you to talk. I was being polite. Oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. And then, and then I think you're going to talk, so I started talking. Skype, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Go ahead, and talk. Go ahead, take your turn. Sorry. Okay. Okay, I will. Uh, yeah, Gordon. I, this is this is an, this this is related to something that I think uh, as a Dark Shadows fan, I, I, I'm not going to proscribe what other Dark Shadows fans should should do, but I can tell you that I look through my bad eye and go like this on one specific issue, and that has to do with Barnabas's alleged age, which I don't think ever really gets said in the series. Like no one ever says, "Hey, happy twenty fifth birthday, Barnabas!" Is you know, forty five year old John of the Frid comes shambling on or or whatever, you know. Uh, but I think the math is that he is supposed to be that age, and uh, you know, you you have to pick and choose what you embrace in terms of the visual world of the show. And the uh, my cat's getting up and doing something weird. Uh, and the uh, and the the text, the text tells us apparently the Barnabas is like twenty five or twenty six, something like that. But reality and our eyes 
tell us something far different. And sometimes this is inconvenient, such as trying to figure out how on earth, you know, a late 40s something Joan Bennett gave birth to little Sarah. You know, so it just is like, oh, come on. Um, but the other part of it, you know, that's where it's tough to believe. But the other part of it is just get in and accept that Barnabas is in his mid 40s. And if right. you accept that Barnabas is in his mid 40s, wow, the story makes a lot more sense. You know, that that he he does have a lot of kind of social retardation, you know, that he is not quite, uh, you know, he, he missed a number of years, you know, with the ladies and and, you know, becoming a Jeremiah type figure. And so and I think he knows it. And so he's there is a, there is a definite air of desperation always to Barnabas and, you know, this weird marriage to Josette this kid and and all of the other stuff and that i think comes to bear on on his decision making with women the likes of which uh gordon you were talking about can i ask a yeah. really weird question and it, this is very very strange but hear, hear me out when i ask this have we really met the real Barnabas Collins, in a sense. I, yeah, Why don't you I ask a different done... type of question? Well, 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 what do you mean by the I real think... Barnabas Collins? Go ahead, Gordon. Sorry. And then I'll... I was about to say, um, I, and this is emphasizing Patrick's question about who's the real Barnabas Collins. I would suggest that the whole series after 210, when we get to 1245, we learn who Barnabas Collins is. Okay. You know, that's the whole journey is that he starts as crazy guy locked up in a, in a, well, as a guy locked in a coffin for, for several years who likes to bite people and he becomes, you know, someone who's less bitey. Here's, here's what I mean by my question. There's, there's a line from Jonathan Fritz Barnabas Collins where he says he remembers playing with Sarah. But he all the the day before Sarah got sick, he remembers mending her doll. Now, when we go back to 1795, he doesn't mend no doll before she gets sick. That doesn't happen. So that's that's the reason for my question. Have we met the real Barnabas Collin? And I'm not saying Jonathan Fred is playing a fake. He's not. But when you begin with time, and again, this all could be off, the events of 1795 all could be offset by Victoria Winter's time travel. That's a possibility because we don't get we that's, don't, that's it. Right, we don't we don't get Phyllis Wick's actual story events anymore because of Victoria. So that's probably the reason we don't get the mending of the doll. Um. So maybe that answers my own question. So sorry. But it, here's my thing. When you kidnap, okay, he kidnaps Maggie Evans. So what? It's it, it's the lovely Catherine Lee Scott. Who wouldn't kidnap her? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> it's I, really interesting. Would not, I would not kidnap. <laughs> kidding. I, yeah, I, I would just, not kidnap her either. I, Kidnapping I, is just bad. I, Kids, I, don't kidnap. Yeah, people. That's the lesson. I'm kidding. Uh, I want to be very clear on that. You know, Joel to each his own. But, but if you were if you were stating an intent to kidnap Catherine Lee Scott, know that Gordon and I will stop you at every turn. <laughs> oh, yeah, we will always be one remember, step ahead. Oh, and, and this one, this one is for the kids watching. First, first, go go have your parents make you a, you a have, big, a full pot of coffee. Before you watch this, but secondly, Patrick and I encourage you: don't kidnap people. That's no, wrong. Don't, do that. no, don't, don't you know, do Jules? That. You're gonna, you're gonna go with Gordon's gonna be coming in from from the west. Uh, Patrick Oster is gonna be coming in from the north, and I'm gonna be coming in from the south. And uh, you're gonna find yourself in a very uncomfortable place 
Uh, Patrick Oster and I are the two Patricks. Um, we are we are known as uh, he is known as uh, Silver Fox, and I'm Bald Eagle. And uh, it, it's a formidable team. Continue. I think, I think when he kidnaps, you know, <laughs> Catherine Lee Scott's character, you know, Maggie Evans, and he looks at her like Josette. It's you sort of feel somewhat sorry for him to a degree because it's like you know this is going to end not well for him as much as it is it is her and you can see a lot of though he's angry by some of the things going on at, during the kidnapping like people keep interrupting him and Maggie's rejection of being Josette you also see and Jonathan Fred does a great job of this you see hurt on his face as well and especially when Willie Loomis is talking to him before he goes down into the basement, he's he's very much hurt. And I love the expression on his face because it feels like a man who he's been through defeat before and to and to go through defeat again like this must really feel like a punch in the gut. And I love that the fact that he does that with his face. So that's my little analogy. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a marvelous moment of acting. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. What's you guys' favorite scene from this episode? I I think for me, it's Barnabas's uh, his his moments of self redefinition, and his the the fact that. You know, in in the way only melodrama can do, he's come. There's no subtext in this episode; it's all text, and it's and it's beautiful text. It's it's very Shakespearean. You know, you talk a lot about the Shakespearean nature of dark shadows, and I go whatever. No, it's right here. Gordon, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm thinking. Hmm. I kind of like. In the scene where where um, Lang is pointing a gun at Barnabas and Barnabas is like, ha ha, you know, y- y- yeah, that's a that's a bad move. And Lang is like, no, you're human now. I can kill you. Yeah. I mean, my favorite part of this is really simplistic. It's it's Addison Powell himself. Addison Powell literally perhaps portrays one of the best mad scientists on television. And doesn't get enough credit for it. Um, one of the most underrated. A- I mean, look, there's a lot. You could say there's a lot of underrated actors on Dark Shadows. Um, but Addison Powell's another one. He just really, really turns it on when when these when he when he's on in front of that camera. And I enjoy watching him as Doctor Eric Lang. Um, really, really cool. He is shameless in the best way. Yeah, he really is. He is shameless in the in the very best way. He it sort of it reminds me when I when I went back and rewatched Reanimator, when I'm watching Jeffrey Combs' character, it reminds me of Addison Powell's performance a bit. And the way Addison Powell could just be so 1000 percent he's calmly talking to you and then the next minute he's just he's ready to the like he's crazy he's got a gun at barnabas he's got he's got the scalpel in jeff clark's face he, you know him and jeff clark tussle it's just such a fun episode to watch um and i really enjoyed alexandra mulkey in this episode um, her coming to Dr. Eric Land looking for Jeff Clark, you know, and really, really great interaction between her and Dr. Lane that I enjoyed very much. Um, it's just always fun to see Alexandra in an episode of DS. It just is for me. I mean, she's playing my she's my favorite she's playing my favorite character. She I really enjoy her in an episode. So is there well, anything they wrote a country song? Do you know that? No, I don't listen to country. There's a yeah, looking for Clark. Yeah, well, you should listen. Is looking for Clark in all the wrong faces. 
continue. <laughs> Is there anything you guys want to add about episode 479? Nope. I think, I think it's I one of my favorites. I think it's one of the most important. It's one of my favorites. It's one of the most important to the canon. Why? Here's a weird question. Why do you think the writers chose this specific episode for Barnabas to make a decision? Dan Curtis. Because it was called 479. Dan Curtis. I, I, Joel, I mean, I, I guess it just is where it fell in the arc of the storytelling. Yeah. I, I don't, I, I really like, again, because they could have, they could have did it up in a prior episode, but the fact, I think the writers, I do agree with you, Dan Curtis overall, but I think the fact that the writers, they almost seem to know when to put the moments in. Okay, we got to have, we got to have this moment for this character. Like when they, when they finally reveal Josette's ghost coming out of the portrait, it just feels like, okay, it's time to, to, to quote, to, to borrow a quote from somebody who was never in dark shadows, but our, our martial arts Lord and savior, Chuck Norris, it's time. And they, the writers just seem to know when it was time to do something for a character or to have that important moment for a character or an important decision that the character finally had to come down on a decision. The writers of Dark Shadows were just intensely smart. Well, let me look something up here uh, because I think there's a, there's a crucial element to this and I suspect I can maybe tell you tell you what it is. The internet moves quickly enough. And well, no, that they, they are okay. So this episode was broadcast April nineteenth, so it would have been after spring break. It would have been, you know, uh, as summer vacation was in the headlights of the car of, that the kids were driving. Uh, and so I think it also is a big suspenseful story arc build up to something cool in terms of audience retention. You know, mm -hmm. this is one of those things that's going to start to cement their kid viewership for, you know, summer, mm -hmm. where they're gonna be competing with playing side and go into the pool and uh uh you know all of the other stuff that the summer of 1968 for kids would have to offer is there anything you guys want to add about this episode before we go nope it is nope. it's a good one it is gordon's turn to pick an episode gordon what episode are you picking buddy 443 443 uh, are you guys good for tomorrow night? I'm good. Patrick, are you good? I like it. Okay. Four, yes. 4.43 tomorrow night. We'll talk about it. Guys, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night at 10.30. You gentlemen have a great night. Good night. Good night. You too.